and we're back but not really um this is research that we've put together over a number of years on a shoestring budget uh while doing a few different competitions we plan to give this talk at a few conferences this year in the 2020 conference cycle but due to COVID-19 that has been canceled but we thought the information was extremely topical so we are here today to present it anyway um I'm Dan, your anchor man. Uh, I'm a professional penetration tester by day, and I also am a director for the Collegiate Penetration Testing Competition, or CPTC. Um, I've recently read the book uh, Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky, and it made me think of a lot of these concepts and how we see them still in the news today. And I wanted to kind of put together some of the, my thoughts on this stuff. Um, and then I'm joined by Mr. Q Anon, who's been doing this work with me for a number of years. It's been uh, three or four years. Who can count the years, right? Um, I've been doing the CPTC OSINT generation. Um, and it's it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, I am Q Anon, the weatherman. Uh, I'm an Im amateur internet troll. I'm not very good at it. I just do it for the love of the, the, love of the game. Uh, I'm a conspiracy fanboy, just in love with those conspiracy theorists because they're so dreamy. Uh, Reddit mod, semi vaxxer, and I have an unhealthy obsession with memes. And today we're here to talk about not only the history of news, which surprisingly isn't new, but also fake news, what that really means, um, the actual operations of putting together some of these astroturfing campaigns. And then how we can spot this uh, in our world today and be prepared for it. Because um, this essentially boils down to propaganda. So quick history of the news. Um, again, basically news has been around forever. It just basically conveys current events. It's people talking about what is happening, uh, what is going on with the current events in the world around them. There's lots of different ways that this has been portrayed over time. And it has some qualities to it that make it uh, more susceptible than other pieces of information. You want to talk about that, QAnon? Yeah, so the newness of news gives it an uncertain quality, right? Um, the first person to report it, it will always have their bias uh, attached to the story. So um, making news or making fake news, if you get your news noticed, it's like any successful ad campaign. It's marketing, it's uh, first impressions, it's all those cliches that you hear about but you know are true about the human condition and how easy it is to imprint information on somebody uh, depending on your message. Uh, so you really don't know with news because it's something that can't be proven quite yet. It is just new information. Uh, you leave it up to like history and other studies to really uh, delve down into what happened or whatever the historians said happened. Yeah. And in journalism, they actually have a concept for this called primary sources of news and secondary sources of news, because what you'll get is you'll get people that are reporting on current events with none of the facts, none of the actual sources at hand. They're reporting secondhand or they're just putting their spin on something. Um, so the source of the news is also very important, right? Do these people come from a place where the news actually happened or are they relaying the news? Uh, so we're going to go through some of the histories, like the pieces of news and how they were generated over time. Um, one of the oldest pieces is folk, folk news. And this is just people talking about their situation and their current events. Yeah, um, it would be when people didn't really have interconnected communities. So somebody would come to their village and they'll be like okay so what's going on with this what's going on with that no one's been around here there's no paper there's no like news besides just word of mouth and uh just the first forms so and we still have this a lot today um i think one of the most popular pieces of folk news is now like social media folk news right and it's just different communities sharing folk news through like facebook groups for example now we're going to get into how that can be different later because social media really opens up the game um, for identity and like what we consider people giving us news. But this is almost 
as core to news as you can get, right? This is your neighbor telling you what's happening. Um, so next we have government proclamations. Uh, this is news from the government. Um, this is basically news that your state is trying to provide you, uh, you know, so that you can be healthy or protect yourself. I think some of the most poignant and like relative examples today are the shelter in place examples from the WHO, from uh, local governments, but it's basically government saying not only like, you know, here's the different steps you should take, but here's the different issues and trying to provide constant official news sources. Um, this can also be helpful. We're going to go through like, as we go through these different news sources, how they offer validity um, and trustworthiness, like folk news, you get the trustworthiness because you know the people you've, you're grown up with these people um, or they've been around you for long periods of time. So you've developed trust bonds with them. These people aren't really incentivized to lie to you. With government the government proc what's up? I was gonna say, whereas on the converse, uh, maybe you're less likely to trust folk news from people that aren't in your immediate circle but live around you. And as uh as a corollary with um with government procl proclamations, there's always people suspecting that their government is up to no good. And so there's always uh, a group of people that either agrees or disagrees with the piece of news by who it's presented by. And uh, there's also people that are aware of that well, that will present the news in a contrarian way and any uh, level of metas around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think you said like a really important thing, like with the government news, like sometimes you can trust it, sometimes you can't. Like um, it all depends on the perspective that you're taking with the government, right? Like in certain cases, you might get government proclamations where you want a trustworthy kind of authoritarian source to say, like, this is what we're looking at from the data. But you also might be concerned because, you know, that government might be trying to manipulate you one way or another. Um, you know, like, for example, North Korean case where they say, like, uh, or China's case where they say we don't have any new outbreaks, right? Like, that's, that's clearly a government proclamation where they're not being honest with you to try and change the, the perspective and the outlook on the situation. Um, so then you also have uh, early news networks. Uh, Q, you wanna talk about these? Yeah, so early news networks were before uh, newspapers and things like that. Um, chronologically, these, these sources of news are how they invented or they evolved with uh, people. So early news networks was like smoke signals or things that would travel long distances so that like maybe you could get the news from a place that was geographically far away. Um, but of course, it would have to be short messages and an agreed upon schema for how those people wanted to communicate. But it would be a way of like if you had people coming to shore or something along those lines or you know, something that was in eye range that you could get news from something that was a, an impending event. Yeah. So this might be like Telegram or Telegraph, um, maybe like short kind of live updates or different things from different events. Uh, today, I think if we were to like resituate that and say, how does this look in a modern event? Maybe it's something like somebody live blogging or live tweeting about an event. You know what I mean? It's, it's like hyper local news about a certain situation you know, and then they're trying to give you micro updates. But yeah, in the history of news, that would have been like, I think telegrams or like, what are they called? The Minutemen, the Minute Express, like early, early postage. Um, and then later we had the rise of the newspaper. The newspaper is super interesting to me because this is also privatized news. I feel like a lot of people, you know, don't take that into consideration. But I find it very interesting that you get these like uh, rich billionaires and then they always tend to go into news or they build out their own news networks and then they always get very political as well. Um, I think you can you see that with like Bloomberg and then you also have the whole Fox News empire, right? So I, I think we see that a lot uh, with privatized news. Yeah, and when the newspaper actually became a thing when they were actually able to print newspapers, um, the newscape looked dramatically similar. It was people that had the money to afford these, you know, I don't even know what that would be worth in this day and age, but it would be, you know, a ton of money. Yeah. But basically, uh, 
yeah, printing presses. Uh, the those printing presses were very expensive, so only rich people could get their opinions out there. Yeah, and that's a really good point because again, it's who's controlling the source of the news, who's controlling these opinions, and why? How can they use that to influence people? Um, again, when you think about very rich people buying newspapers and then becoming political, they can then influence people's opinions on certain politicians who could then, you know, change laws that help protect their money and their wealth. So you can see how all this becomes very closely tied together, uh, I think, at those like late game expensive stages. And then we have Newswire. Cute. Newswire was uh, essentially when telegraphs began. Uh, when telegraphs uh, started being used, that was like newspaper, but electronic, and you could send a smoke signal from uh, the other side of the world. And it was generally used for government information. It was, it was not really used privately, but it was one of the fastest ways to uh, move news around the world. Uh, with the rise of the newspaper, you know, it was as slow as people could carry the newspaper, slow as the shipping could happen. But with the newswire, you got people that were able to get news instantly from the other side of the world. Surprise. Hey, Australia, what's up? Maybe uh, keep an eye on that shore. Yeah. And again, if we can bring it back to that first point, um, the quicker it is and the more limited your availability to those sources of truth, the more you can influence it, right? Because now you have that 24 hour lead on the rest of the world where you can get that news out and you're the only one with that break, that story, you know? But again, we're starting to shift sources, right? Like if you are getting this news via newswire, it's likely secondary source or you're getting it from the primary source. But my point is, is now we're talking about news around the world, news where there's people repeating news and, you know, it might not be directly relevant to them. And it's like the whisper down the lane thing. I feel like the more that happens, the more people will start to lose the details or manipulate the details on purpose uh, to fit their their perspective or their prerogative. We co- we played that game in kindergarten, but we called it telephone. You just called it telephone straight up? Yeah, yeah straight up telephone. And I always change the story. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's great. Q, you want to talk about this one? Uh, So TV and radio, um, that was essentially the speed of Newswire, but released to the general public. Of course, at that point, it wasn't as easy to build build TV broadcasters or radio broadcasters, at least ones that couldn't um, transmit very far. But it was the fact that people really got uh, oriented with the news in their home, with the news following them around, with this content that was created by this very limited group of people that really, like, I feel like they knew the power, but they didn't know the power of it as as strongly as, like, uh, I hate to say this, but, like, psyops and stuff today. Yeah, no, I, I think, like, a lot of technologies at the time, it was still very... Uh, nascent, you know what I mean? Very new. But I think if you look at other places, like, for example, Germany in World War II, they had like national radio, right? And propaganda happening over the radio. So I think you you see examples of this stuff being abused very early and the extent to which it can be abused. Um, well, we didn't have propaganda in America. It was just called being a patriot. And well, we get to say that because we won. We have tons of propaganda. And yeah, we're going to see lots of examples of that. Um, And again, this is almost bigger than uh, newspapers because of the reach, right? Like you can record these events, you can run them 24-7 on your channel. Um, It's incredible reach. And then you also get advertisements. Uh, So I think news, TV, and radio is just like really kind of blowing the lid off of the mass media and reaching so many different people around the world. And here's the topic of the presentation. Anyone can make news. You can do it. My friend Dan can do it. Anyone can do it. And that's just the thing. Those controls that were in that were in the arms of the powerful, that uh, you know, only rich people could wield. Now anyone can wield that. On the converse, that means 
anybody with a bigger budget than you can have a bigger reach. And so it's pretty much, or uh, anybody that's more determined, has more people, doesn't necessarily have to be about money anymore. Money can help you expand your reach on the internet, but so can organic looking movements that use other people's uh, already in place system systems to make your systems look more important and more legitimate. You get retweeted by somebody who's famous or someone who has sway, all of a sudden you have some of their power with your message. And so really it just becomes one big marketing smorgasbord where it's just like getting your message in front of the right people at the right time to make it go, to make it go viral. Bingo Flamingo Q. You hit the, you hit the news, uh, the nail on the head. So that's what we're going to go into, which are, what are some of these techniques that you can do? We're going to call it astroturfing when you create this fake internet presence, uh, that is not yourself when you basically create fake people for fake social sentiment. Um, and we're going to get, we're going to dig into that and we're going to talk about like, how can you influence things to go viral? Uh, how can you influence more susceptible groups, people that you specifically want to influence and target? Um, and what are the signs of this and how can you tell somebody's doing this? And John Oliver was talking about AstroTurf. He said it was because it was, it represented a fake grassroots movement. So I wanted to take a moment to steal his joke. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's literally where the name comes from. It's fake grassroots. So yeah, that's hits, hits it on the head. Yeah. It's really on the nose. Um, so we have a bunch of different kinds of fake news. Like why would you be interested in doing this? What is the motivation? And then how do you go about it? Uh, I think my favorite satire one is probably the onion, right? Like, that is some of the best fake news around. And then my favorite is when the onion becomes real. Like when you have these articles that start as fake news and then, you know, we just, it happens. And then it's, that's that crazy world. Yeah. And it's usually like, there's some level of sarcasm. There's some level of um, irony, irony, but it's not too deep. It's just like, kind of like an obvious statement. Like, (sighs) You know, some some somebody makes a like quote unquote pseudo deep observation on society, and then then they're like, "Oh, we live in a society," and then they're like, "Oh my god," and it's just like, um, I I don't think satire is it can be deep, it can, uh, but but to be appreciated by most people, it has to be fairly shallow. Yeah, it is pretty base. And you got parody. Oh my god. Parody is like, uh, is like, <laughs> don't laugh, man. Uh, parody is like, um, uh, what is it? Uh, what's that one that's just the headline and it's just like some like totally ridiculous headline worse than the onion? I'm not familiar. It's like clickbait or something like that. Click hole? Click hole, thank you. <laughs> parody would be click hole. I'm sorry, I couldn't think of the name. Parody would be like click hole, like completely ridiculous making fun of the satire right because it's making fun of satirical news by being even more ridiculous but i feel like on the internet when you start to have all this satire and parody it's it's like pose law right like all of a sudden on the internet people take this seriously people you you can't just parody stuff on the internet and not say it's parody okay that's that's like there's sort of a beautiful artistic form in Poe's law, right? Uh, and for anybody that is familiar with, <laughs> just stop, let me, let me, because this is something that's very important to me, is um, uh, Poe's law is when you cannot discern whether or not someone is just being incredibly stupid to make you think that they are that stupid, but actually they know what they're doing, or if they are really that stupid. Wait, wait, uh, so wait, 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 the pose, the real definition of pose law is anybody on the internet, if they're making an extreme statement and they don't tell you it's on purpose, you know, parody, you can't tell the difference because there's just extreme people on the internet. Yeah. Well, you know, there's Christians against dinosaurs, right? Pose law, <laughs> it, like they kept it up for a while, but they eventually cracked, you know, um, uh, various, various, like, uh, groups like Christians Against Seedless Watermelons. I'm sorry, those ones are just the ones that are coming to my mind, but it's basically 
people will sit there and try to make the most logical sounding argument they can about a ridiculous point to the effect of getting people to believe that they really hold those convictions. Wow. Okay, so it, it is literally f- like leaning into Poe's Law. Yeah. It's internet. It's it's internet trolling. Uh, okay. <laughs> propaganda. You want to take this one? So propaganda is used as an instrument to control people, right? It is used as a way of... Um, of getting people to think a certain way. Um, I like to think the ASPCA commercials are propaganda. Um, you know, where Sarah McLaughlin's like crying on the wings of an angel. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's used in a lot of different ways. Like the US has used propaganda to influence regime changes by dividing particle line or particle party lines in different countries so that they can get their way and who they want elected by just generally spreading fake news about them and doing things like that. So we've been doing this to a lot of countries for a lot of years. So has Russia. So has a lot of other countries. This is just a thing you do when you want power and you want to control a populace. So you can be government propaganda for your people to be like cool with it. Like, hey, we got to go do this. You can be government propaganda to other people uh, pretending to be them or pretending to or uh, trying to get them trying to get the populace over to your side. I believe there was a uh, Iraq war. I could be wrong about this uh, uh, thing where they like dropped pamphlets on the people trying to convince them like, hey, the U.S. were pretty cool guys. So, like, you know, overthrow your governor. That's you know, there's been funny. a lot of documented and. Uh, uh what is it uh, uh when they had the clearance removed from a from a um from an operation that they've done there have been a lot of those uh that the u.s has done in the 60s and things like that yeah i think the u.s is a very strong track record for propaganda like even just the outright explicit stuff like the i want you campaigns and all of that kind of the draft uh even what is it uh uh what is it, Belt Betty? What is the, the strong American woman? Like all of that is examples of propaganda. Mm-hmm. But I also think there's more insidious propaganda in the United States. Like a lot of our democratic propaganda or things that we think are free speech are actually forms of propaganda uh, designed, like you said, to influence us and get us to think or agree with certain, um, you know, initiatives, political initiatives like war, for example, right? So I think America is definitely supercharged with propaganda and we just don't always see it. it. We're kind of blind to it because we think it's democratic and we think it's not as direct as it might be. Yeah. And if you want to go super tinfoil hat, the movies, man, they convince, they condition us to be like a certain way and it's the CIA, bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you also have like literally America's army and the U S military putting out a video game. Like, tell me that's not propaganda. <laughs> is it good though? What? Yeah, it is. It's fun. Okay. <laughs> Legit. Um, so kind of have to talk about this, right? Like when we're talking about news and we're talking about the sixties, uh, basically Noam Chomsky, like if you haven't checked out, um, manufacturing consent, it's an amazing book where he talks about the Vietnam war and how you can make these people appear to be the bad guy when in reality you're going well out of your way you know if somebody were to look at it from an unbiased perspective the the thing that that party is doing is potentially unethical you know what i mean but the way that they condition their population they just get them used to these ideas and then you'll also see a ton of outrage about this you'll see protests and then what's crazy if you go into this book is they really like it goes down into information warfare like people will set up fake protests or fake outrage and have them do things like, you know, get violent, right? Because then it discredits the protesters. So you start getting information warfare where people are doing fake information campaigns against somebody that's upset with their stuff to make their side look weaker. Yeah. uh, And that can be done like with an argument online, forum sliding, any number of uh, different techniques to um, really, you know, to really get people to believe that one side is weaker than the other by um, just making their arguments weak, making them appear weak, 
making them appear violent, making them appear like any sort of sco- of uh, cultural scapegoat that they can get. They will make that opponent look like that. They will drill on that point and they will plant operatives in there to make it appear that way as well. It's yeah, it's really cool stuff. And it's a lot of uh, distraction too, like dissuasion. Like if they ever come up with a good point, um, I think you had said this previously, but it takes far more effort to dispel a lie than it does to prove a truth, right? So yeah, sometimes I believe it. It's uh, it's hard to convince you that you've been lied to because like I'm too good to get lied to. I'm too good to believe a lie. Also, just the effort that it takes, right? Like I could throw out three lies really quick, hardly thinking about them, and then the effort that it takes you to go validate those and fact check each of those. The onus is on you. You have to do all this work, right? Whereas That's I just a good point. threw something out very quickly. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of this is used as like a distractionary technique. So when you get in an argument, it's really easy to bring up, you know, quick shots fired over somewhere else to distract people from maybe a legitimate point they were making and detract. That was from actually, a, um, there was a, uh, I forget which political party in the U S did this, but they had like a guide for doing this. For if you wanted to be an online dissenter, all you had to do was just make people over explain their points until they were just exhausted and they'd wasted their time. Meanwhile, you're seeding as much as you can in other directions while you're wasting that one rational thought at one rational person's time. Yeah. And we were talking about trolling earlier. Like that is the troll's dream, right? Like you just get the person to rage quit. You infuriate them off of the forum. Yeah, that is the dream job. Why are you mad, bro? And and <laughs> you're right. Like people, it's literally jobs. Like uh, in Russia, you have entire places filled with like troll warehouses where people do this online on social media campaigns. In India, you have click farms, right? And you have social media farms um, where people are doing this stuff. They're setting up fake uh, AstroTurf profiles to click through. They're setting up CAPTCHA click-throughs. Um, so you have literally industries designed uh to get around these controls and to manipulate this stuff just remember uh 4chan says if you rage you lose and that's so true with any sort of online argument if you get angry that's apparent in your writing so anybody that's arguing with you if they know how to click those buttons with you they know how to make you look incensed and for you to lose credibility Yeah. And that's what we're going to get to also later, which is when you target these groups, uh, targeting the more extreme groups, groups that are easily incensed, uh, groups that, you know, have these extremist views are the groups that you're going to get the rise out of. You're going to get them to be actionable. uh, And that's what you want. Um. So, yeah, basically, all most news has moved to the online world. I'm pretty sure uh, newspapers are having trouble keeping up with it. Um, and what's crazy, too, is now you have places like Forbes putting out opinion pieces, and it's all associated to the Forbes domain. So now you'll get, like, you know, just somebody writing this crazy opinion article, and all of a sudden they, they lead it with a Forbes domain. So... Yeah, we're getting basically bloggers that now have the credibility of these major news sources because it's just all online. It's insane. It really is. Like uh, somebody writes a piece, it gets the instant brand recognition of Forbes, the brand yeah. recognition of CNN. Somehow they get an opinion piece uh, draw, and that opinion piece becomes uh, more than an opinion because it comes from uh, a source that has this, this well-known brand. Yeah, exactly. I I thought uh I forget the the guy's name, but he's a democratic kind of newscaster. Um but he did this recent little segment where he's just talking in his backyard and he basically shames modern newscasters for their overreaction of the whole COVID situation. They're like, you know, we need you guys to be reasonable and sound, like you are the voice of the world when you freak out and you you know, have these scary headlines like panic in the headline that is going to seep into society and everybody will react that way. And it just, it makes so much sense because it's like, who are they interviewing in their articles? Are they interviewing scientists? Are they interviewing doctors, right? 
or are they just interviewing random people? Because if you attach any of that to the Forbes logo, it doesn't matter who they interview. People are going to believe it. Yeah, uh, there's a responsibility from the brand owner to either uh, to either chase after that and file a do not desist or, or get rid of the person or for them to just roll with it because they don't want to say that they have uh, offered out their brand or maybe it got them so much uh, traffic to their site that they don't care if it's a little bit false because look at how much traffic that title got to their site. Bingo, dude. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. So like, yeah, even if it is a bad article, it's that clickbaitiness that generates all those clicks. I, I forget where this was, but I literally saw this article the other day um, that said Elon Musk didn't donate all of these uh, CPAP machines. Yeah, yeah, in California. Like it was like a CNN article that said he did not do this. And then Elon responded to it and he's like, he adds the governor of California and he's like, yo, get them to correct this. I absolutely did. And then a bunch of doctors where he donated them to in places in California were like, he did. Like, here's the machines he sent us. Um, And it's just mind blowing to see like a professional news organization put out this article that is like in the title, factually wrong. The entire point of the article is false. Yeah. And it's just. And and the crazy thing is, is like once that hits Twitter, once that's out, that has impact. People aren't going to read Elon's comment. You know what I mean? And They're the not going to. People look into these things more uh, when they see a title like this, or they see something that's like uh, really like what? No, that can't be right. And they go and they look at it and they find out that it's not. However, people get confirmation bias really easily. If I see a headline I agree with, it's true. So yeah. if I think that Elon is just some uh, commie space cowboy, I'm going to be like, Boom. yeah, that commie didn't even come through. Like, yeah. I, yeah, I knew it. And I'm going to go on with my day. I'm going to tell other people that haven't seen that article that Elon is a, is a commie space cowboy. And, and people are going to believe it because I'm yeah. believable because I'm your neighbor. Yeah. And, and that's the problem is like these news organizations not only have an obligation to vet this information before they publish it, but they have to publish redactions when it's false, right? Like that article was up there for more than a few hours when I had read it. Um, so exactly right. Like people are using basically clickbaity SEO tar- uh, tactics to get people into their news stories. And that's not what we need from the news. Like that's not what we need from news at all. We need legitimate factual news that can help us make informed decisions and honestly, that's probably how you'll get more readers. You know? Yeah, I mean, you're not though. Let's be let's be real. Click, click it, yeah. it works. Click yeah, it, it works. Um, but SEO tactics, meaning like, you know what? I can go and I can post a right wing article on a right wing board, and I can get so many clicks. I can post that same right wing article on a left wing board and get just as many clicks of irate people. Yeah. And so it's just like. Really, you just go to a politically charged board. You go to a board that is very passionate about the thing that you want to share, your clickbait title, you know? And um, the and SEO it, still happens all the time. Like people will just litter links all over the place, you know, to their articles, to their sites. Uh, like that stuff is very real. So every comment, every share, every click, every like, every every way that an article or thing is interacted with is tracked gives it credibility because it's more popular the more popular it is the the more legitimacy it, legitimacy it seems to have you can even have six yeah. or seven different versions of that article on different like uh random one-off domains and link to them and link back and forth and then you're on the front page of google you have the first six results and all it is is you reaffirming yourself yeah. And that's, that's kind of what we talked about those secondary news sources. When you're looking at this from a third party source, like I can't stand when you get an infosec uh, piece of news that will break and you get like seven different uh, sites or news people all write the same exact story about this thing. They all write like, you know, the same information. And then people will use that to validate their points, right? Like, well, here's more that points that this is real, right? But these are all going off of one primary source, right? And they all got it from TDNet. 
yeah, the information here is very weak, like really. Um, but you'll see that mass proliferation of it. And all of a sudden, this is a big story, you know? Um, and then this is also very true too, like, right? Like you can create your own comments. You can create your own controversy in your comments. Uh, and all of a sudden you seem popular, right? Or if you're sharing this from a popular account, all of a sudden this now has a ton of weight to it because just thousands of people have seen it. Use a sock account call out that sock account with a better sock account and then say, I knew you were a shill. It's like, there's no limit to the things that you can do to make yourself look better with, with unnumber, uh, unlimited number of fake people. Right. So you can make unconvincing fake people, convincing fake people, and you can make them all over the board and you can really play this information warfare game. It's really, really fun. Yeah, and we get into it too that like uh, for a long time, especially before the Cambridge Analytica stuff, a lot of these social media organizations or even these sites are incentivized to let this happen. Like they want you to create a number of fake blogs. They want you to proliferate this information. Of course they can tell that this post is the same exact content posted on a different page. Like of course they have that technology, right? But they <laughs> let it happen it's because- so there's an underscore yeah e e even without I it like put a new underscore in there. even without it like literally the same profile picture on some account that's not being used like you know this is fake all you have tons of machine learning data to tell you this is fake you know um but they like the numbers it's active users it's active content it's people posting on their system right it it's that that's what their shareholders want to see I mean, if you can't prove that they're fake people, then they're real people. That means all those real people just saw those ads on your platform. All those ads need to pay up because real people legitimately saw them. Bingo. Ad revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a great, like, that's a great would, point. Why would you mess with something that was getting you a ton of ad revenue? If somebody's stirring the pot on your platform and it's generating so much traffic and the money machine is just going Burr. are you going to stop that no unless somebody stops you and there's a whole cambridge analytica thing about you yeah and we get to that so quick vibe check how do we tell if accounts are legit vibe check what if they have a good web page q i mean <laughs> It seems that's, legit. It looks, that's that's my vibe check noise. Is it? Yeah. It was really good. Thank you. I, I do a lot of vibe checking. Oh my God, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what about if they've got a legit looking web page, right? Uh, I mean, it, it can't be that hard to make a web page. Well, I mean, it just depends on the skill level, the expertise. It, it depends on who you're hiring to do your web development. Turns out it's really freaking hard to make a website. Um, there's templates, there's developers that'll do it for you. Like there's, you, you could probably get it done on Fiverr. Uh, I think having a legitimate website You can't shows do it nothing. on Fiverr though. I'm pretty you sure I could get $5 to get somebody to build me a website. <laughs> You, it's not like you can give them like $200 and say, make this look just like CNN. Or maybe you just use something to rip off somebody's web page and you just change a couple of the icons, whatever, you know? Yeah, we literally have tools to do exactly that. Like clone a page exactly and steal all of the assets oh, yeah. and the images. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, I've, I've cloned so many web pages. I've done so many like phishing attacks, lookalike pages. Uh, websites are extremely difficult. I feel like to prove the identity of, um, you know, you can have homophone domains. Like your domain is literally the only thing you're going off of is like this exact URL belongs to this company. And yeah. I know that just because I've seen it on some source that I trust, like yeah. all you have to go off of. But, you know, you add confusing subdomains on top of that or in front of it. And then all of a sudden you've got, you know. Yeah. Uh, 
different TLDs. Like, like this is the Indian version of CNN, right? Like, who the fuck knows? You know, different weird sub uh, subfixes that look like it's you know WW dash one or something like that. Something that normal people aren't going to pick up on, and you might not pick up on if the piece of news is agreeable enough. Yeah, that's the other more thing too. agreeable the news is, the harder it is to actually see something that would disprove what your own bias tells you. Yeah, and a lot of times too, you could even get redirectors. Like many times people just check the link when they click it, right? Like, okay, where is this taking me? But they're not checking the final URL when the article loads, you know, do I trust what's actually telling me this information? Yeah. So I mean, oh well it has a lock. Yo, if you get you have a semantic scan done, pretty much good to go. Yeah, there's a lock on the web page, so you know it's legit. Yeah, that's how yeah. you know. That's how it's you know. Great. It's trustworthy news. Yeah. Um, but but vibe check like a website means nothing to me. If you have a website, yeah. like good job. Congratulations. Yeah, as, as you can tell by our um, extraordinary uh, PowerPoint presentation, anyone can make a website because yeah. it, it's that easy. Like our graphics, on point. I, I put a lot of stock into how things aesthetically look right that 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 to me conveys truthfulness yeah if it, if it looks aesthetic enough pff, you're good you don't even you don't even need to tell me anymore we're good yeah, we're graphic sorry. design is my passion yeah anyway yeah um speaking of graphic design uh if if it's a well-known brand and they have graphics then we're probably good right yeah like yeah. it's really hard to make employees and graphics so I, I love this, and this is only going to get better. Um, every one of these photos is AI generated. These are all deep fakes. And I mean, you can really see it when you like look at faces like this guy's face. Like, <laughs> Look at lower left. Yeah, like lower left's got something going on with her forehead. Oh, my God. He needs to go to a doctor. She's I mean, part stadium. Yeah, bottom center right here. That guy's oh, eye is in trouble. Wow. Well, I mean, the, the most important thing is look at the picture before you use it as one of your profile pictures. <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're making these fake profiles for sure, but also you have to uh, tin eye it, make sure it's not a reused image. Like I have an example here later, um, where these people literally use the same Google image that everybody uses, right? Like, it's yeah, very obviously image reuse. And then even then, when you have unique images, like sometimes they're just garbage. Um, I think if you're really going to do this, one of the best ways to do it is to use real photos unique real photos somehow that you can produce and source yeah uh, obviously Hire some kids at the park it won't be weird again fiverr like get some dude to go take these photos for you and send you these photos like no connection like maybe the connection's on fiverr but really there will be little connection or you just never mind <laughs> yeah. was gonna be Keep weird territory yeah um so again the deep fakes are only getting better i think if you see professional unique photos of individuals i don't even know if you can trust that nowadays um okay. yeah like it, well, you can at least you know know that you're you can at least be a connoisseur of less expensively produced fake news that's true but, like you know if, you won't be duped as easily and in the end you're never going to have perfect fidelity with this yeah. You're never going to not fall for fake news. That's yeah. The you should yeah. just know the indicators to look for. You you can stop the presentation now because there is no silver bullet. Like we don't tell you <laughs> how you spot fake news at the end of this. Like it's it's yeah. all bad news. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, th there's there's no silver bullet, and yeah, when I see somebody with like a professional headshot now and this super expensive photo, I think, what are you trying to sell me? Like why did like why do you do this it's just because of vendors bro <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i do it because i have to because everybody else does it <laughs> um so this this one gets to me right like you're arguing with somebody on twitter and then all of a sudden they have a hundred thousand followers and you just get people like shitting on your day because obviously your opinions are wrong because you don't have as many followers or the influence <laughs> Ding dong, your opinion's wrong. <laughs> you know wrong. nothing, Jon Snow. Nothing. <laughs> so. yeah, no, no, it's terrible because it's just like, you know, the, the, all they had to do to get followers was get followers. 
So you can you can get yourself a bunch of fake followers, right? And then like people that don't care to check out your followers after you unfollow like ninety percent of them. <laughs> important follows eighty people and has like three hundred thousand followers, right? That's that's the pattern. That's how you know if someone's legit. Also, also like uh, fake expertise bias, right? Like somebody gets new, they get this huge influx of followers because people want to help them because they're new. And then all of a sudden people are looking to them for like expertise and advice because they've been here for all this time when that's not why they have the followers. And then- I begged for help and now I'm the expert. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, And honestly, like a lot of times I think this goes to people's heads, right? Like- you get somebody that's in the industry only one or two years and now they think they're like super hot. You know what Careful. I mean? We, we know about you and you know, okay. people you feud with, it's just, you know, moving on. They're clowns and they don't know anything. So you can buy Twitter followers. If you didn't know it's cheap, it's easy. <laughs> uh, I don't suggest it because you're just going to get crap interaction. Um, but it's like again obvious. the platform allows this which is what i love like they have all these like bot cleanups and all this bullshit like uh-uh son uh-uh you aren't cleaning up just, like they know about these bots and they're not cleaning them up like they're just cleaning up you know the nail that sticks out they're cleaning up the stuff that makes a problem yeah exactly somebody points out fake news okay let's back that up somebody counts out a few hundred dozen bot accounts and they're like, maybe we should remove two or three of them just so we look like <laughs> we're doing something. No, I, we will get to this later. Um, okay. A bunch of these sites have made improvements, right? Like, y- y- we both know how easy it used to be to AstroTurf on Facebook. And oh, now it's, it's a dream. It, now it's much harder. So, yeah, we get to this in a minute. Like, they, they do well. Or they're doing better. But, uh... You can't use follower count as any type of legitimacy. Like, like these networks are probably bigger than many legitimate networks. I know, you know, some of the most real Twitter users that I know, like just real people that work everyday jobs. You know what I mean? And they have like 200 followers and they're following 200 people. And it's like just your average kind of Twitter user, right? And then you see these people with hundreds of thousands of followers and they're following 30,000 people and they do these huge follow back things. Like, of course, this person is like just farming this shit like come on i mean you know call me old mcdonald <laughs> yeah just just farming those happy meals exactly so this this is what i love i love this one um this was a campaign that i was tracking which was what originally got me into astroturfing I found this company called click ssl and they were putting out fake articles they were getting published in like magazines like all kinds of crap and all of it was fake. Like all of it was fake to build fake security legitimacy so they could sell TLS certificates. Like the most elaborate bullshit I've ever seen. Um, dude, to, to the point that they had a fake location in Delaware, right? And like a fake US phone number. And I called them. I called them on the goddamn phone. And the dude is very clearly Indian with an Indian accent. And I'm like, Hey, I'm looking for Abel Wilkes. And he's like, Oh, she's not here right now. I'm like, can I talk to anybody that doesn't have an Indian accent? Like you're in Delaware, right? Like, can you put somebody on outside? Couldn't, couldn't happen. Like could not happen. I mean, it's possible. It's possible. It's pretty possible. It is. I mean, it's not likely. And that's the most likely thing, but it is possible that they were chilling in Delaware. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they're in Delaware. (laughs) Right there, Newark, Delaware. Like, you can see it right there, dude. Yeah. Studied at Newark College. Words on a page. Words on a page. So legit. (laughs) And then if you look over here, you see that Sophie Perone is also in every Photoshop tutorial ever on, like, (laughs) how to quickly edit a photo. You know what? You know why I think this really got you, though. I think it really got you because it was such a terrible attempt, and it was so successful. It was wild how low effort it took these people, like low to no effort, to do this fake astroturfing, and it was wildly successful before, like you know, they had to clamp the clamp things down. 
And that's, that's just how crazy it was, was you could just do this for whatever. If you were, if you were hip to it, you could, you could make any grassroots thing you wanted um, with very little effort um, that they just weren't checking. It was wonderful. Yeah. It, and it really still is this way. Like they're, Click SSL is probably still in business, right? Like they're still doing their thing. Um, yeah, I just got a cert from them two weeks ago, actually. Yeah. They're, and, they're <laughs> all right. So now we wanted to take a shot at this and try and uh, basically doing our own astroturfing. Um, we'd seen this all over the internet, seen like a bunch of different people doing this astroturfing. And we had this CPTC competition where we had to set up this fake company. And we were like, this is a great opportunity to use CPTC uh, to get some experience trying to do this astroturfing and see what it's like. What are the pitfalls? Um, what are the challenges? And how hard is this really to do and create these influence campaigns? Uh, Sorry, I was going to say it was a great opportunity uh, for new dynamics in the gameplay too for uh, people to actually get hyped on the game beforehand, right? Uh, yeah. If you knew that there was something to look up about the company, then you could kind of, you could, you could do a proper pen test uh, to it. And, and so that, that was just really an awesome, like extra added bonus to the game with very minimal uh, amount of investment on our part. Yeah. One of my favorite things too, you hit the nail on the head, right? Like the students loved getting involved in this because they could get involved in this before the competition. So I loved visiting the students and seeing these rooms where you had like these elaborate, like investigative detective, like uh, mind maps where there's like all these like social media printouts and they're like drawing lines between things like this profile is connected to this profile via these ways. Um, but in doing this, obviously, all of these identities are astroturfed. Like, none of these are real people, and we're creating a fake company, right? So we have the same challenges outside of the game as, you know, uh, these people doing this, this sentiment and, like, impressioning do. Um, and it turns out, you know, we did this for, what, four or five years? It turns out it was very easy, especially the first few years. Like, it was, like, cakewalk. Uh, and then after the great hack thing after Cambridge Analytica, uh, this all got a little bit more difficult and, you know, we'll go through it. Yeah. I mean, um, it was, it was, we didn't have, uh, as much, we, we weren't as good when we started off. So it was a major learning curve to actually have, uh, restrictions put into place all of a sudden where we couldn't just go willy nilly through these platforms and just add things and whatnot. Like we got better iteratively every year and then all of a sudden we just hit this huge setback but it was just took a little bit of creative thinking and that's uh, really the meat of what this presentation is going to go into is the kind of creative thinking it took uh, and a little bit of extra effort it took us to go through the same things that we did back then. Yeah and one of the things we should repeat uh, that we said at the beginning was like we had almost no budget right just Q and I doing this and um you'll see like we found a ton of ways to automate this and, you know, run these campaigns in an automated fashion with almost no support. So first things first, probably the most important thing is just a uh, sock puppet tracking. So we'd have huge spreadsheets. Um, every time we did this, uh, every sheet, we would track date of births, uh, locations where we put them, um, and the different accounts they had. This was just to make sure we could get all the details right across to all of the different uh, profiles and that the person would be on and that we'd have this consistency so that they just wouldn't immediately fall apart when people started poking at them and looking at them. And then here we also, you know, tracked how complete things were as profiles got burned. Um, and we would have different sheets for different campaigns that we were running. By the way, if you try to do this without organizing your sock puppets, you're in for a bad time because it is very hard to keep track of all of these without some sort of, uh, of of just keeping the records uh i don't know why you blurred out the passwords on fake accounts but um i guess that's good practice so keep it up yeah and uh um again like these profiles probably all have value and then we'll talk about it but over time we revisit them and we reuse them so then once you start getting your fake profiles together 
uh, it's very important to start, in my opinion, getting them to join not only fake communities that you've created or because this will give you ways to control all of them through single posts, kind of like botnets, but then also legitimate communities and start to get them involved in more legitimate ties. And then you can build legitimate connections in legitimate communities. Um, and these give your, your astroturfing people more legitimate uh, existences. Yeah, if you say generally uh, things that people can agree with or post things that people can interact with, and the more people that you interact with, the more people think you're real. The more real interactions you have, the more effort it is on your part, uh, and the more automation that you have to put in as well. Um, so, you know, we had to uh, we had to think of that both in the ways of how to interact with other people and ourselves. Um, yeah. yeah, and we, we've scripted a lot of our own fake community interaction out. And then you can even script a uh, real community interaction out, right? Like whenever you, I think the cyber potato is a great example of that on Twitter, right? Like whenever he sees a, a tweet with the word cyber, he just replaces it and replies to it with the word potato instead of cyber. Um, and what that does is it's obviously automated, but it generates tons of real interaction because people find it intriguing. Um, and on hashtags too. So so here we have basically uh, communities now that will trigger off of each other. And then we have all these automated responses and basically scripting or bots. So uh, for example, here, as soon as Reddit posts anything um, or what we're doing here is first we're starting by if there's a blog we follow, then we're propagating this source. And now we've curated this with a bunch of different blogs. Many of them are probably legitimate news sources and the idea here is you're just building up credibility on the account. Um, but we've also peppered in a few of our own alternative or custom sources. So this way we can start to influence that narrative that this account is putting out. Um, One of the uh, things you want to keep in mind, though, is with tools like IFTTT, uh, it will stamp your media with from IFTTT. So it's fairly obvious that someone is coordinating something just based on what um, this website uh, describes as its device type, quote unquote, uh, that can be changed, but I don't believe it can be changed in IFTTT because of the implications. Yeah, that's a great point. So we're using IFTT here to automate all this. And you can use a bunch of these different uh, applications to do this. I think Zapdex is another one, or you can even write a bot to hit the APIs to do it all on your own. It depends on your budget. And uh, Q brings up a good point. Like all of this is packaged with bit.ly links and bit.ly you can actually get all of the campaign information on that link so there's like counter intel and intel leaks that are happening here and depending on how nefarious the campaign is you really want to consider that stuff or like cut some of that stuff out because it could lead back to you know who's behind the campaign um or again like like you saying like uh campaign association and analysis like showing which of these different profiles are all connected together based on this stuff but from a propagation point, like we're also seeing how then once we get these posts uh, onto our blogs and our Tumblrs and our Reddits, we're then propagating it out to the rest of their accounts. And, uh, you know, I want to bring up uh, a story that I don't remember the details, but I remember the general gist of it. And it was like CIA operatives or some kind of operatives in some country like Italy or Spain or one of those Europe places. Um, they all only called each other. Like they never yep. called anybody else. It was in right? France. It was, oh, okay. It was France. It was one of those Europe places. Um, and they were tracked down um, based simply on the metadata of the fact that they never called anybody outside of that small circle of friends. Yeah. Yeah. That looks like a terrorist cell. <laughs> but um, even then too, like if you get the whole decentralized kind of terrorist cell, like looking at it like those spider cells, like even then the way that they propagate a lot of their, their information is they try not to show that any one account is in the lead, right? Like if we were doing all of this, we don't just want one account, like taking all the news and then filtering it to a bunch of other accounts because that could, it's very obvious, very quick. You want a decentralized kind of circle where like they're all sharing each other's stuff uh, automatically. But again, you don't want a one-to-one -one overlap. You don't want everybody sharing everybody's stuff because then it becomes very quickly to tie all these campaigns together. 
So. And you want to vary your language of each character as well, but we can we can get into that later. But yeah, uh, essentially, if everybody talks the same, sentiment then, analysis. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So really, what you want is you want as little overlap as possible, and you also want to start seeding these accounts way before you're actually going to use them or put them into operation. So what it ends up looking like is people just creating random fake accounts and then they just sit dormant for a long period of time. And the thing that gives them an air of legitimacy is how long that they've been open because the more posts that you share, the less likely someone's going to scroll all the way to the bottom and see joined Facebook 2019 in October. Exactly. Yeah. So the age of the accounts is one of the number one ways that we tell legitimacy, but we'll see so you that know like, libertarians wouldn't like them. <laughs> on Facebook? Because our accounts are too old. Like we see them beforehand. They're not new. <laughs> I'm not following. Okay. It's fine. So uh, on this one, you want to uh, see your accounts. Uh, basically as soon as possible like you want to create these accounts way before you're ever going to use them um and you just want them to be dormant and then ready for your campaign and you want to be posting on them either automated or actively so that it builds up this reputation uh versus you know just being a puppet yeah uh maintaining those connections with other people that don't think that you're socks um and things along those lines like uh just may uh Finding a group that has nothing to do with what you're astroturfing, joining a football group, joining a meme group, joining any group that gives you uh, a, an air of legitimacy, like you're part of these communities. More than one profile picture is really good if you can manage it. Uh, going yeah. back to Dan's point about um, about paying somebody on Fiverr to go take creepy pictures of somebody. Absolutely. Like, because yeah. if you're doing AI generated photos, you're only going to get one photo. And you really want those unique photos and then multiple of the same target to build on that legitimacy. If you go around and start copying all these photos from another account, it'll very quickly pop up and show that it's fake, especially on something like Facebook. They'll notice that you're taking these photos from another account. Um, so basically, a lot of almost all internet authentication is rooted in your email. Uh, if you can do an email reset or a domain reset, like if you own the domain and you can do an email reset because you own the domain, then you can own basically root ownership for a lot of internet accounts. Um, this is true for most social media nowadays, although a lot of them are moving towards phone numbers as well. But we're going to talk about, uh, you know, what what is the best email you can get for proving your a real person even when you're not yeah um so what we ran into with this was signing up for accounts and how many level or how how often we would get asked for a phone number it was really like our litmus test for whatever we whether or not whatever we were doing was successful and then further on uh whenever one of our accounts got shut down we know that we did something wrong yeah uh, so um, one of the first things that we noticed was when we opened uh, Facebook accounts with Gmail, it wouldn't ask us for a phone number. Um, but when we would try to open Gmail accounts on uh, IP addresses that we hadn't been as careful with, it would start prompting us for phone numbers. Uh, pretty much surmised there was like five, uh, five Gmail addresses you could sign up for um, within like a certain IP space. I don't have it down to a draft science, but anyway, you get past all of this by owning a custom domain email hosted by Google. And you might think, wow, well, I don't want to pay $5 an email address. That's ridiculous. One of the fun things you can do is you can alias other email addresses to your initial email address. So you can set up as many at whatevers.com and have them all go to your email address. Now keep in mind, too many of those, it's an outlier. It's gonna be obvious you're running a campaign. So you can probably only fit a few on there unless you're saying like they're all from a certain place and you're representing that work. And even then it's still going to trigger something for a manual investigation. Now yeah. when we look at Matt here, 
you look at Outlook, Yahoo, Apple, or a custom domain. Well, I think right? I think you talk about the um, Android sign up technique too. I think that's a really powerful way to bypass the two factor phone verification because just these recent years we started getting a lot more uh, phone checks on just signing up for that Gmail. Yeah. Um, so when I started signing up for Gmail on a cell phone, I'd get five IP addresses, or I mean five different email addresses before it would ask me for another, uh, it, before it would ask me for a phone number. And this but, was all using an Android phone that wasn't associated to a SIM, but on a LAN. Oh yeah. That's a really important, uh, it's really important point. So on my same LAN that I had already been poisoning the well with carelessness, it still gave me five accounts per profile, not per device, but we're going to get into that a little bit later. Okay. Um, but it was, a, it, it was a new way to manage these accounts without getting them shut down as easily. And then um, adding, uh, doing the domain hosting by Google, that was also a really great uh, finding as well. Yeah. Um, moving on to like meh tier. Uh, Outlook, Yahoo, Apple, custom domains. Usually what we would see with that is we would still need phone numbers. Um, and shit tier was we would always need a phone number from literally every social media when we would try to use one of these disposable email addresses. It's like somebody had already done that a bunch. Yeah. And back in the day, we used to use these religiously. Like we used to run a muck with Mailinator, right? Oh yeah, it was so great. Or change it to sharks with lasers when they just blocked Mailinator specifically. Yeah, yeah. Or mail.com, like use that forever as well. And that was fine. I'm um, pretty sure we got malware from that one. You might, definitely for sure. But uh it worked as far as like signing up for these things for a long time until that Cambridge yeah. Analytica stuff came out. And then you saw a lot more of these tightened down. Like LinkedIn is a great one now where they've tightened down the controls where you almost always need, you know, some form of a phone or a legitimate email to get that registration through. Yeah. But the accounts that were created back in the day are still all existing with all of their crappy protection. You know what I mean? Like that didn't have the validation when they were originally created. Their grandfather did. Exactly. Um, so Twitter actually has very strict verification. Now you used to be able to get a bunch of fake tweets in or uh, fake Twitter accounts in. Um, and then only after you like violated enough stuff, would they start to send you uh, verification and they would send you this like second check a few days into your life, um, which was nice, but also like kind of painful as a, a bot operator because you would have a bunch of accounts that you put a little bit into work into before you lost them. So it's, it's kind of like they made it a little more valuable before they took it away from you. Yeah. And that was what was really funny because they do allow, I believe you can have two uh, Twitter accounts per phone number. But you um, may be able to, yeah. Yeah, I'm don't don't check though, uh, in case I'm completely wrong. But um, it was it was because we would set up a Facebook, we would set up a Reddit, we would set up a Twitter, we would set up a LinkedIn. Um, sometimes the Facebook would go away because we were being sloppy or you know something like that. But Twitter would just after after the Cambridge uh, stuff, uh, Twitter became like the number one stopping. It's not like. We couldn't get things past it, but we lost a lot of great fake people. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And it was also awesome for tracking different sentiment and then, you know, replying to hashtags. Uh, it was probably one of the easier systems to bot as well. You could write things that would auto reply within Twitter uh, much easier than Facebook. So it was a great platform for running bots and doing influence for sure. And again, still possible like today. We still like we still use Twitter and we don't use Facebook currently, right? So yeah, and the second that we tried developer options with Facebook, bam, account banned immediately. Give me a phone number. It was just like uh, it was disheartening. Yeah. So Twitter is much stricter, but uh, it's still doable and worth the payoff, to be honest. Yeah. Um, this is just an example of botting. Um, basically, what you want to do is you then, usually most of these platforms offer an API. Like Reddit is super nice because their API, they basically have per subreddit uh, controls on how you can bot. But um, you basically want to monitor certain topics, monitor certain keywords, and then 
in our example, it was really poor, but uh, we basically had like Markov chain uh, generators for comments that, you know, would form like almost nonsensical comments or just popular comments we'd pull from a list. But um, I think in a perfect world, you could do something, you know, more machine learning based or more intelligent based comment systems. Uh, I think the quality of your comments will add to the quality of the post a lot, right? Like if your comments aren't believable, it's going to be kind of obvious that they're bot comments. If you can search for an exact comment, um, then more than likely the discerning uh, eye will catch your campaign. But um, it's not to say everybody won't catch your campaign. Uh, one of the most impressive things about uh, this sort of endeavor is that um, even if you do a terrible job, some people will believe you. Yeah, so, you know, honestly, that. that's what we're going for here is just noise generation, right? Like we just want to show traction on the post, right? It's less about the quality of the comments and more just are there comments? Are there a lot of comments? Yeah. Um, so do you want to talk about Facebook and some of the struggles there, Q? So Facebook uh, would be... Um, Actually, like, take it in two parts. Talk about old Facebook and when we started doing a lot of these ops and then talk about, you know, after the Cambridge Analytica stuff. Old Facebook, we would just sign up, um, generate accounts, add people. We, I think there might have been a limit on friends that you could add a day before it got really suspicious, but it was something ridiculous. Like We were getting banned when we were adding... Minutes. Yeah, we were getting banned when we would just sign up. And the day we signed up, we would add hundreds of like random people. We would get banned. But we would also sign up that same day from similar IP addresses with different people and only add like 10 to 20 people at a time and no bans. I believe it was like 90 at the time that we get away with without like flagging anything. But, you know, um, just uh, be careful who you add as friends because uh, you know, let's say you're... Uh, Say you can get some unwelcome messages in some cases. We'll go over that later. Yeah. Um, but uh, after the Cambridge thing, it was it was really difficult. You, I think they added some more controls as to um, what kind of behaviors were suspicious. Uh, they started caring about IP addresses. They started arbitrarily banning you if you like. Um, I never. In some cases, I never even got a reason why, because I felt like I had been safe or I hadn't made any uh, mistakes, but maybe yeah. my VPN had leaked or something. It was it was very weird and random, but it was still more, uh, even uh, even later on in the game, it was still easier to do than, than Twitter. And uh, it was a good way to fake being regular people. Like, Twitter is like the voice of someone who wants to shout something really quick. But Facebook is a place where you connect with people and share stories. And so you really take a hold of that. I hate to use this term, but I don't hate to use it. You take hold of that mythology, you know, of like what Facebook's supposed to be, which is your neighborhood, your friends, your, your uh, people that have similar interests uh, with you. So you make those friends, you make those interests, and it was and it, uh, and it was just slightly easier, but not as uh, automatable. Interesting, very interesting. Cool takeaways. Yeah, I I definitely agree with uh, the groups, and I think Facebook groups are very influenceable. You know what I mean? I think you get people in there, and it's very hard to validate who's in there or like you know where they're coming from or the legitimacy of the profile because you might not know them. But I think people take those groups pretty seriously. Um, so forum bots, uh, Reddit, we kind of talked about this, but they are all about the botting. Reddit offers controls down to every subreddit, very fine grained controls over like, can you like stuff with a bot? Can you upvote stuff with a bot? Because then you can automate what content rises to the top of that subreddit. Um, and they also have things like bots that will look across all subreddits for certain topics and then post on certain topics or connect different threads when they have the same topic. Uh, so I, I think that's very interesting to see how botting has proliferated on Reddit and then how you can use it also for this, this kind of sentiment influence. Yeah. I didn't do too much on the Reddit botting, but I know um, a lot of Reddit bots um, like 
cup and pa- uh, cup and pasta emoji uh, emoji generator and stuff like that. You know, exactly. It's it's part of the culture on that site. Yeah, it a hundred percent is. So here we have automated posts, uh, you know, which are being automated from Wikipedia articles of the day. And they're also coming from other people's Twitters. So we're having post propagation across different platforms. And then we're having automated comments on those posts. And again, here we're seeding legitimate content, Wikipedia articles of the day. The idea is we're trying to um, build up trustworthiness or, you know, sharing valid uh, articles and valid news. Now, if we had wanted to, um, if we wanted to influence something beyond uh, just trying to grab whatever content we were trying to grab, uh, it would have been easy to set up like a news aggregator for any type of news that would fit what we were trying to, uh, what message we were trying to uh, convey and how. Uh, that part would have been easy, but during these competitions, we usually stuck to just whatever content we could throw on there just to bury things in the noise. Uh, yeah. If you're going to do a massive disinformation campaign, I highly recommend figuring out the theme and the marketing message of your disinformation campaign and getting content together, um, especially for getting it on the news feeds appearing more and more often because that is what the um, high traffic generators do. Yeah, and we talk about that too. Like, um, basically, you want to have exactly like you said, like content feeds or hoppers of your you know, pre-selected uh, and triaged content, right? And then you want to schedule these to post at influenceable times, right? Like right after dinner or all these different marketing times. Um, and we go into that on some of those techniques, how people can set that up. Another thing I want to highlight here too is the short links. Like we're using all these different, here it's a Twitter short link and then later Bitly short links. But we're using all these short links so we can control that redirection, right? We're using Wikipedia and we're throwing out this authority authoritative source but then we're controlling the links and we're controlling the destination uh blogs and comments uh, my blog gets riddled with seo it's like every day there are people posting just keywords or things because my blog will come up in google and then they'll add their link to it to their service that they're trying to sell um you know, I think this is massive and the blogs support this. They encourage this. Like you can create a blog that is just advertising, right? And then link it everywhere. Um, so I, I, I think the blogs actually encourage this kind of spamming, if you will. Yeah. I mean, any, um, any comment box is a goal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Any place you can leave your message somewhere else on the internet, right. And link back to your, your content is, a you know, a beachhead. Yep. This was, um, I just want to say a couple words. Uh, we used Google plus, uh, to begin with for a little while. It wasn't very popular. Nobody else really used it, but you know, it was another social network and, um, and they passed. Uh, <laughs> I love Google 2018. plus. I love Google um, plus. I use that religiously. Rest in power. Google plus. <laughs> you want to talk about LinkedIn? LinkedIn's a yeah, pain LinkedIn. in my ass. <laughs> LinkedIn is banana town because um, if I signed up, uh, okay, the pre Cambridge days, it was easy. Uh, you could sign up with anything, say you did anything. Uh, they didn't really care. The post Cambridge uh, days, a few, when I tried to sign up for my computer, it was like, no, you've used this device too many times. But when I signed up with a phone, it just, it would let me sign up whenever, whatever. Uninstall the app, reinstall the app, make another account, uh, however you wanted to do it. If it was from their mobile application, they trust it implicitly. Um, now, keep in mind, any of these things that we bring up can change at any moment because they always add a new check or things like that. Right, right. But, you know, I'll double tap that message. Like LinkedIn, they will do phone verification and they started doing that after the Cambridge uh, stuff became very public, but any account I have on LinkedIn, like after it's been verified, like anything goes like I've, I've posted the most ridiculous content there. I've created fake businesses, which reshare ridiculous content. You know, I feel like there's almost no validation once you get past that gate. Yeah. And I feel like, uh, they, 
they may have even let me reuse a phone number a few times. Like yeah. you definitely want to check to see if it'll let you reuse a phone number. Um, it would not take Google voice phone numbers though. Yeah. Wah, wah, wah. And a lot of these services, and this is something that we probably should have brought up earlier, won't take phone numbers that are to soft phones. Right. They'll but- only take hard phone numbers. Yeah, but a prepaid phone subscription, right? A, a fifteen dollar calling card, and you're in the game. Yeah. Um, and so once you get these phones, I actually like loading a bunch of profiles onto a quick burner phone, and then you keep them in the profiles of Chrome or whatever on Android. But then you have a phone that has like ten profiles on it that's good to go, right? It can get all of its two fact right to the thing. I kind of like yeah. it. It is. It, it's, 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 nice. it's limiting, but I could also see then automating that. And like, you know, those click farms that they have. I mean, you know, there's any number of ways to interact with a phone um, with ADB or things like that. And um, uh, yeah. So automation, how do we automate these accounts? How do we move them forward? Uh, Like basically two people setting up massive astroturfing campaigns. How do we stay on top of it all and post from all of these accounts every day without getting them busted? Uh, for for showing this i'll be honest it's different on each platform you have to change some of your automation it helps to use officially supported integrations like iftt so that way you're not writing one-off little bots or automators for every platform um and long story short there's a ton of hacks and this is extremely doable so here we have like a bunch of iftt uh patterns and recipes um, and they're basically uh, reposting stuff across different accounts and then also reposting legitimate news sources just so that way this account makes noise. Every day he's saying something, every day he's posting content. Do um, you have anything to add here, Q? Uh, no. I mean, really, it was, it was either this or the APIs. And we'll probably get into more of that in a couple of slides. But pretty much IFTT was just cruise control for get it done. Like post yeah. some content make it look uh fine and it'll work for you know uh astroturfing that has no consequence yeah agreed so here's kind of what you're talking about about the content hopper so this is buffer buffer lets you um stack uh articles and campaigns and then you can also link a number of different accounts uh social media accounts and then we can schedule these so we can have like a huge hopper of you know, pre-triage content, we can randomly push this out. Uh, we can randomly push it out over certain times or we can schedule everything. Um, Buffer offers a free service. If you're really getting into it, I think you would probably get the paid service. Uh, and then, you know, it can connect all kinds of social media. And then again, just automated, very uh, strategic posting. So this one was really neat. This was kind of a hack to do your own buffer just using Google events. But here you create a Google calendar event um, and the start and the title of the event is what you want to post. And then the content of the event or the description of the event is the content of the post. And in this way, you can set up an entire year's worth of content in Google calendar and then have it automate this stuff through any number of accounts. uh, In this case, IFTT. But it's just a way then to use a calendar, to use an API, to pull this content via an API with like times and everything preset and then kind of fire and automate these bots and stuff off of it and then manage it with a calendar. So I thought this was a very nice view and way to kind of manage uh, social media, automated social media posting. And then again, here we see a lot of the same content. We see... um, retweets from different like propagation so we're we're sending stuff across uh platforms and then we're also automating some of the content that's coming in it's set to specific times that we've already said scheduled and then we're also just doing kind of like daily news from legitimate sources so now we're really trying to start to mix a lot of these automated news sources we're influencing some of our own message and then we're also just adding kind of reshares and normal noise on this account You want to talk about any of this, Q? So um, you can do that, or you can script it. Uh, we found that scripting with APIs, uh, you know, getting dev accounts and things like that, 
uh, the first thing scrutinized and the first thing that'll trigger a Facebook phone number request. Uh, same with LinkedIn, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, same with uh, Twitter. And I don't know if I checked LinkedIn, but um, you can use things like Selenium to synthesize browser clicks and things like that. If you don't want to sign up for IFTT or you want to make it look legitimate and you want to just, you know, have a script send content to your Selenium scripts to um, start executing and sharing pages manually, you can do that. Um, and it's fairly easy. Idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. And then um, a lot of these uh, like w rich social media front ends will do exactly that. They'll have browsers or they'll cla track mouse movement and all these things to make sure people are really using a browser interacting with this and not just like phantom JS and like loading headless browsers to interact with stuff or scrape their pages or scrape their content. So I, I'm a strong believer in this where like automating that GUI interaction of using the social media is probably very powerful for bypassing those fake fraud controls and those checks. As long as your user agent doesn't say Selenium in it. Yeah, yeah. But honestly, fixing a user agent's easy. I know. I mean, just, you know. You uh, so yeah, talk about these. Phone. This was by far um, the most effective way to deal with uh, making and managing fake accounts when uh, we would um, when we were faced with uh, tougher verifications post Cambridge. Uh, so uh, physical phones were really great because for the most part applications trusted when the mobile app made it because click farms aren't really as popular here in the United States or not as known to be popular. Um, so physical phones uh, can have multiple profiles. Uh, from what I found, having multiple profiles wasn't really very stable. It slowed the phone down and there was some data that le uh, leaked between sessions and things like that. Uh, for instance, I would have a VPN installed on one profile and I'd had install that same VPN on another profile, but um, even if I turned, uh, it would still override the second profile with the VPN um, and, and just hmm. things like that where it would notice uh, like Facebook for some, on one of my fake accounts somehow got my real friends, uh, even though I think I only checked one email from uh, an account on my primary uh, profile. Uh, basically what I'm getting at is uh, since you're sharing the device's storage, if the application has excessive access to that storage, it can uh, determine if it's on the same thing and it can also uh, lead to um, just for them to easily find you if they really needed to. But right. for the purposes of our project, it was very useful. Yeah, well, I mean, you hit on a great point, right? Like I think Not Dan tweeted about this a few days ago and uh, we know this from working at Uber, right? Which is, that they actually have device identifiers that can be tracked across device resets. So you can see, is this account used on multiple devices or are multiple accounts used on a single device? Um, and that's a feature of Android and it, it's very effective. And I know it's both in Facebook and in the Uber app. Um, but you can spoof your device ID. You can, but not a lot of people do. You know what I mean? Well, I'm just saying, like, for every uh, mitigation control that people have when they're trying to set up new accounts or things like that, um, things like that are, there are always bypasses. You can spoof, as long as you know what the metric is for what they are using to detect you or what they could be using to detect you, you can spoof that metric to something else. But Very you always point. have to keep this sort of cat and mouse uh, game in mind. And you also have to know, like, how much effort are they going to really do and are they going to are they going to even possibly risk um uh uh are they going to are they going to possibly risk messing with legitimate customers on the thought that you might be a bot if they're not entirely sure and right. so you want to make sure you want to dance that line and the threshold for where they do push that line and mess with customers is abuse right like how bad is it in the real world um I, I thought, uh, you know, that was just a great example with the phones and then how they're tracking the phones across some of these apps nowadays. Let's go to the next one. 
So multi-login was uh, an astroturfer's dream, right? It was basically made for astroturfing. Uh, it has all the controls built in for every single way that a uh, website can track you. Uh, I'll go over those on another slide in about two slides. But basically multi-login had a way of uh, completely changing, spoofing, or disabling uh, any sort of traffic method that, or any sort of tracking method that um, that uh, a website would throw at you for legitimacy. And uh, it had multiple application containers or uh, user account containers that you could use. So you had this idea of shareable containers that could connect to uh, whatever VPN you set them to, and people would be able to access them with a set of credentials like anything else. So you could download it and all the profile information would be stored in the cloud within uh, multi-login. It was a paid solution, but they didn't really check on emails or anything like that. So you could have 10 profiles, open another email, have another 10 profiles. Uh, issues that came about from it was it was wonky. It was unstable. It was, it just didn't feel too great. And without, um, without residential proxies, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, it was kind of useless because uh, even though you had all these devices that you were spoofing, you still had the same IP address, you know, or there's still the same range. So you couldn't really do very much with it. Same things with Mozilla Profile Manager, except you would have to do those customizations and things yourself. And, um, you know, it was a draw. How much of that work did you want to do yourself? And uh, with Mozilla Profile Manager, it was a little bit harder to share profiles. I'm sure we could have done it. I'm sure we could have engineered something, but there's a free version and a paid version like much everything in life. But these were really good solutions to explore. And I think like the multi-login, we looked at that for a while. Although I, I like the final solution, which was the, the farm phones, phone farm. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about those? Uh, well, I mean, I just, uh, getting into, uh, I think I covered it a little bit more, but, uh, essentially getting into the phones themselves, um, they had a limit of five profiles, but you and just emula- had to build that prop. And we're not always using real phones here too. Like we're also using emulators, right? Yeah. Those weren't, uh, very effective. Okay. Uh, blue stacks and x86 virtual machines. Um, or x86 Android virtual machines, you know, the ones you can get off of OX boxes. Yeah. Those had the same sort of success rate as uh, just using a PC. Oh, okay, uh, okay. And those had the same sort of, uh, you can put proxies and VPNs in there too. Uh, for any account signups, I needed to verify. It's like Google already thought that somebody might be making a bunch of fake accounts with blue stacks. I don't know. Uh, for anybody that's not familiar, BlueStacks was a uh, Android emulation platform. You just double click and install. And x86 uh, OS Box virtual machines were uh, x86 Android images that you could run within VirtualBox or VMware or any of that fun stuff. But they weren't really any more effective than using a uh, regular computer. Yeah. And then what we ended up doing was a lot of burner phones and loading multiple profiles onto burner phones. Um, and then once that was set up, uh, then continuing to seed those accounts once we have computers, once we've started the accounts with the phones. Problem with burner phones is sometimes they're a little bit more difficult to root. Um, so you weren't able to add more than five profiles at a time uh, yeah. with, with a lot of them because you would need to edit that build.prop and you would need to change the number of profiles to something like 20 because any more than 20 in your stuff, phone just starts dragging. Yeah. Um, so you want to talk about some of these methods now as well for like hiding now that IP connection and that source. Okay. So first of all, you've got VPNs, right? Uh, you purchase a VPN, uh, from, uh, or you use a free VPN that's burned. Everybody's already used it for account creation and everything like that. You can pretty much assume that anything free has been burned. Yeah. A lot of these uh, would so, not work for us at all when we were using them to set up yeah, accounts. Data center proxies, another one. Places will set up a ton of proxies and then let you use them through the data center. Even paid ones. They knew it was coming from a data center. Real people don't live in data centers. Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, uh, and then residential proxies uh, were, you know, some VPN providers backdoored their VPN uh, clients and let people use those backdoors for money. Pool that was VPN, cool. Illuminati VPN. Those are my favorite. Those I do that. Know. It's amazing. It was hilarious until they were like, we only give it to white hat hackers and, and, uh, and every and for research and everything like that. It's just like, yeah, but you didn't use to until you got busted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is that is the the solution to use by the way illuminati vpn yeah absolutely uh, or the super duper illegal one <laughs> oh what you make them yourself you just you just find a vulnerability you find it on shodan next slide <laughs> I, i'm not saying do that i'm just saying you could do that and so basically um there's a lot of things that your browser can do to track you. Um, it's unclear how many of these social media sites used on us. All right. Uh, your IP address was obviously the big one, right? Little set of numbers, pretty easily trackable. Busted us uh, all the time. User agent is on everything. Yeah. User agent is on everything. Um, bury up your user agent. It's really not that hard. Everyone... But pick legitimate ones don't don't pick ones that don't exist yeah you know don't be an outlier don't think that you know um you know ferrari testarossa browser is really gonna <laughs> do you any good you know pick something that's obviously been used but don't use the same thing for all of your because you're basically you don't want any one data set to look identical to all of your campaigns because that could burn all of your bots potent or all of your accounts all of your efforts potentially um audio context objects this one was a real hoot this one it would even if your volume was off it would play some sort of ultrasonic or non-hearable sound and your microphone would pick it up and it would be able to fingerprint you that way um webgl fingerprints uh that's this that's, stuff's insane yeah this so uh, this stuff is nuts WebGL fingerprints, like it would just draw a canvas and a bunch of stuff and it would time how long it would take. It would benchmark your system and give you sort of a fingerprint of a benchmark. Not only that, but I've looked into a lot of the WebGL fingerprints. Like it's insane the stuff that the different graphics cards now offer to the browser. Like, and you can very accurately fingerprint somebody's hardware through a browser now. It's pretty wild. It's nuts. Font enumeration. Let's say you're doing like anybody that's doing good astroturfing work does, and you are grabbing the fonts of the companies and things you're trying to mimic. Well, if you've got all of your sock profiles on that computer or on that device, um, you might have a very specific set of, of fonts. Or let's say they get a ton of font signups uh, that has, you know, they're, it's just about numbers, like how many other people you, your traffic is like, and are you like too many other people's traffic? Um, it's, it's a fine line. Uh, yeah, you really want to be in the middle, right? You don't want to have your devices connected to your other devices, but at the same time, you don't want to be anomalous. You don't want to like be outside of the herd. Absolutely. And... Um, I'm just looking for the notes I had on that one because there was another point to make, but we can skip it. Yeah. Um, so this is a really important point, right? Like, I don't know how many accounts we've opened that have been shut down, right? Um, and then the flip side, right? Like, we've made accounts that have just never been shut down, accounts that we still have tons of access to today. And I don't know if 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 I could like put a mark on it, right? Like there's no defining factor for which accounts get burned and which accounts stay active. Um, it's nuts. Like some of the ones that you were like, you, you posted so much crap on those accounts, didn't get banned. We shared like th three things on another account, Insta banned. It yeah. was just like, it, that's why I, I show all those uh, browser fingerprints in the, in the last slide is because, um, I mean, this is just presumption on my part, but you never know which ones they could arbitrarily turn on or turn off. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And it's just wild to me, though, because we've literally had these like Rube Goldberg machines of automation that have just been posting nonsense to these websites for years. Like, I've just never turned this stuff off. And it just goes. And like, still today, it just goes. You can just check on it. And it's like just posting into the ether all the time. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> But we get to my favorite part about not falling in love, being a woman profile. Oh, yeah. Uh, being a woman oh on the internet. God. Good luck. Oh, my God. Sorry. I'm going to say sorry. Sorry, literally every woman on the internet. <laughs> um, we, we picked, we, uh, we signed up some profiles, which is not beautiful. We did some like beautiful women, some normal looking women and, and everything like that. And basically, we tried to find normal looking people, right? People that would be- that you would believe would work at a company. Yeah. And you would not imagine the kind of attention we got, especially when Dan here added like 100 random people. And then they added me. And then we just started getting friend requests like gangbusters. But all of it was was like high in, in Messenger, which makes you... I won't get into it, but you get wait, people waving high in Messenger, which is like instant creep alert, right? I, I literally got dosed with dicks, man. Like I got so many. I wasn't going to say it. I got so many video requests of just people's junk out that my browser crashed. Like like just Facebook Messenger video chat, dick out, browser crashed. I got PTSD from being a woman on the internet. I <laughs> say it. Like, it's a traumatizing it, experience. It was just like you understood like all the cliches, like if he waves at you on Facebook Messenger, it's like Whoa, you know, or or any of that because it was like, you know, it was. And when you got the messages, it was like, oh, here it comes. Oh shit! This guy sent me something. <laughs> it was never a surprise. It wasn't good. It was never yeah. good. It's never yeah. a good thing. So you don't, yeah, you don't, you don't want this, Dewey. Um, puppet reuse, this is actually really powerful. You've basically built up all this legitimacy from your previous campaigns. And then it's a year later, what hasn't been banned? Let's reuse that on another campaign. Um, it's the downside is you're now associating your campaigns across campaigns from an OPSEC perspective. It's probably very bad idea and you don't want to do it. Um, but from a legitimacy and ease of use perspective, it's very nice. I mean, you could always make those accounts, uh, the counter accounts to whatever your current campaign is. <laughs> Just start like calling out the astroturfing. Exactly. Accounts. I, I love me some meta. Um, so finally, let's bring this all home. Let's, let's kind of talk about like, now that we've seen how some people do this and we've seen some of the challenges, let's look at this again in the wild. If you haven't seen the movie, The Great Hack, it's on Netflix highly encourage people to go watch this movie it was fantastic um it's basically the cambridge analytica documentary where they talk about how they did the sentiment analysis and they pulled all this data on people from social media and then they found extremist people people that were easily incensed by these different ideas people that were easily outraged and then they did targeted advertising against these people and kind of sent them propaganda directly and then these people were motivated um you know, basically the, the lock her up campaign, right? Like the, but her emails, right? Like all these people that attacked Hillary Clinton so viciously were, you know, more or less manipulated by a campaign to attack Hillary Clinton. Like, and you know, you may believe in that or you may not, but like that was a massive propaganda campaign. I mean, there was legitimate user interaction, but that goes right back to our talk about fake, uh, fake grassroots. Now we're, I, I really want to stress this, we're not trying to deliver a partisan message. Yeah, we're not no way. Trying to, we, this is just a really big hack that happened. Uh, we don't really, well, personally, I don't really care about, like, you know, the politics of it as much as the art form of the astroturfing itself. Yeah, exactly. Like, we are not taking a political spin on this. We are very apolitical people. But you can't deny that astroturfing was used in the 2016 election. You can't deny that these are very active propaganda techniques. 
Um, and I think we should look at them, right? Because it's, it's absolutely propaganda techniques. Yeah. I mean, anytime anything, like any sentiment just like appears out of nowhere where, uh, but I mean the, the, um, and this is where I'm going to get kind of into, uh, my, my degree of, uh, meme history. Um, you, you see this sort of viral outcry with really successful memes too. So it's hard to actually discern what is like legitimate hype right away and what is not take, uh, that boy you the tiger king right uh i'd say it was on netflix two days before i saw my first few memes about it and then it just exploded it was everywhere instantly now yeah. that feels like it was legitimate and for in all respects we have no evidence to point to otherwise but if you really wanted to get something exciting and you made something like that wouldn't you make some crappy memes about it and put it in some shit posting groups absolutely and Possible. i think I think we've seen the flip side of that too. I think we've seen purely manufactured memes hit like mainstream society because people just start pushing a meme, right? And it's caught on. Like, yeah. like I think the, the okay symbol becoming like a white power symbol, right? Like that was a 4chan propagated meme that hit mainstream media, right? Like it, it wasn't. Yeah, 4chan did that with a lot. That was, that was 4chan's modus operandi. It was like, what can we get these, these people that are highly angry and easy, easily manipulated, easily, easily manipulated, believe it. Exactly. What, what innocuous thing can we tell them and they'll believe it? And that's why, you know, that whole, that adage, you rage, you lose, is so important is because if you're already angry, you can't make good memes, first of all. But that's <laughs> not to do this competition or this, this, uh, this conversation. Uh, but if you're truly angry, you can't think with the rational mind about anything that you see because you are always going to have that implicit bias. Exactly. It's a really good point. Um, so I just want to like talk about, again, like things where we see this in public, right? Where we are seeing this happening today and it's kind of important, right? Um, I think the Raid Area 51 memes were amazing. Basically, again, you had 4chan promoting this notion that people it wasn't on 4chan. It was just some random stoner uh, um, out somewhere that like did a Facebook invite page. Okay, so you you had random like again like uh, decentralized news. Like anybody can make this news. Yeah. So you had a random troll, random guy make this Facebook post that says, you know, we're gonna raid Area 51 on what was the day? Like what some special day? It was it was like September nineteenth or something along those lines. But I mean the the lines that were there were you can't stop all of us. Yeah. And and, and then, like some people got in there and they made some really dank memes. <laughs> and but so, it was mostly like, fake, like people doing it in satire. Oh yeah, absolutely. But then people started saying you shouldn't do this. And we realized what kind of I mean, they realized what kind of goal they gold they had on their hands with people legitimately thinking that they're going to do this. And so what did they do? They dug into it deeper. They said, we are going to do this. We're going to Naruto run. We're going to clap some alien cheeks. You know, so they made it funny. And they made more people that were in on the joke able to propagate it. And once they had more people in on the joke, more people heard about it, more people that thought it was serious commented like, you know, they're going to kill you all. And so they're like, they came into <laughs> that whole like millennial, like I want to die like thing. And they're like, yeah, that's what we're looking forward to. Strong vibe. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to Naruto run. Whoever survives, clap an alien cheeks. Yeah. And I mean, the vibe check clearly passes there, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. So, so what did, what did we do? We ran it on national news. They ran it on national news. That was <laughs> the most, that was probably the happiest day of last year. <laughs> <laughs> when I was like, this is getting huge. People are noticing when it gets on the national news, that's when we know it's good. But then he sold out to the FBI and just did a stupid music festival. We <laughs> some carnage, but no, we didn't. So, so that brings us to an extremely uh, poignant topic, right? Which is the reopen America campaigns. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I read this Krebs article where Krebs basically says this guy, Mr. Murphy is registering all of these uh domains across america like reopen minnesota reopen pa all these different domains right and um you also have at the same time all these facebook groups popping up like people organizing these protests and people are calling these protests astroturfed they're saying 
the people creating the groups and stuff on Facebook are generally fake profiles. Although you do have a lot of real people then showing up to these protests and obviously real outrage. Um, but I find it very interesting that you have so much astroturfing around the subject. I mean, real people showed up to Area 51. That's real a good point. people showed up there knowing it was a joke. That's um, a really good point. protesters um, are things that are used all the time, especially if you're short on money. There's no way that we know if any of those protesters were real or how many of them were real. Uh, I personally believe that it was a mixture. It was probably some people that were just there um, being paid to be there. And it was probably some people that legitimately felt like the points being brought up were good because they uh, are contrary to uh, the typical news because they they assume that anything that they hear on the news is, is false. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. I feel like a lot of people just want to be contrarian and want to show up and just, you know, kind of object to something. But I think I think one of the most the parts that stick out to me the most are like whether or not you agree with the issue when you see the signs of astroturfing and you see this the, the, the many signs that we've talked about, about like people automating this social media or, you know, using these fake profiles to put this influence in those signs raise warning for me, right? Like the fact that one person registered multiple states reopening to me says that's not a grassroots movement, right? That's not PA saying reopen PA, right? That's one man saying reopen all these states. And it was sloppy. Yeah, and it was very sloppy. That's, you know, how he got caught. And then let's, let's take the other angle. So then he goes to Mother Jones and he publishes an article where he says he's being framed as the bad guy and he bought these things to stop the protests. And again, just like the controversy and the confusion to me, all signal disinformation, all signal bad stuff, not a clear story. And somebody trying to obscure the message so they can do what we've talked about, right? Which is present um, a perspective that, you know, maybe other people won't dig deep enough, right? And they will be persuaded by this perspective. And you really don't want to get lost in the meta on this either, because there are any number of iterations on what people were trying to accomplish when you actually look into it, right? So um, you could think that it was the guy publishing it um, meant to open those up to stop somebody uh, from opening, from registering all those pages, or maybe right. they were just, and it was very left leaning, right leaning back and forth. Um, the types of people that were into these stories and not. So because I would implore you that even um, if it's a grass move, grassroots movement and it's political, look into it. Yeah, figure out, point. you know, figure out what's going on. Like if some new movement comes out out of nowhere or has a slow buildup, but like shocking similarities, um, uh, be wary of it. Yeah. You know? and, and I think that's really like the main message here, right? Which is if something has these signs, if they have, you know, um, this flavor of astroturfing or potentially like disinformation or manipulation, uh, don't attach any strong opinions on it until like more of the details shake out, right? Let it become history and not news, you know, or, or try and find these details and shake out that truth out of the situation. Investigate but, people that are talking about these sorts of things, investigate the sources, but you're not going to be able to do that for everybody. You're just yeah. not. We live in too much of a high consumption. And, and sorry if I get like all, you know, we live in a society, but we, we consume a lot of data very quickly. No, um, I agree. You have to pick and choose your battles. And I think exactly. getting caught up in all of these like, you know, campaigns to do this stuff with these highly charged people can be dangerous, right? Like you have to be careful about uh, getting into these very emotional campaigns. Because, you know, I think that's that's how they get you a lot, right? Like they rally you up and then you go to war. And next thing you know, you're in a four to five year long campaign with debt and people dying, right? Because you got rallied up in a moment to agree to an idea. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you disagreed uh, or uh, represented a threat by exposing a SOC group. There's also repercussions to that. Yeah. You, if, you, if people actually believe you and you start to expose a SOC group, they can turn it right around on you. and make you public enemy i mean yeah. anything is anything is possible and you should treat it like any other sort of warfare be it information warfare or le legitimate warfare 
you know, um, the disruption, the bigger the disruption you cause or uh, anything like that, the more of a target you can become. I'm sure Krebs has had tons of people get mad at him because he's ruined their campaigns. Yeah, he has. He's had multiple people attack him. It's really good insight. I mean, you All right, get Q. really... Oh, I was just going to finish it off with this one statement. Uh, yeah. You get really... You put a lot of effort into a... Uh, um, into a sock account or a second or a campaign or something like that. Just think about it. Human nature, you know, somebody's going to get mad if you screw up all their hard work. Yeah. And this is absolutely people's jobs. Like the people that are doing this professionally um, are doing it full time. They're getting paid big money to do this. Like propaganda is, is not a sm- like powerful people are doing this because they want to manipulate large groups of people. Um, we're doing it for fun. We're just trying to give you guys some insight into how it works. For the lulls. For the lulls. All right, Q, I want to thank you. Uh, your insights have been very uh, impressive and impactful. So thank you very much. Oh, yours too. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> how do I uh, exit um, AOL? <laughs>